So we're going to talk here about an unusual and somewhat rare condition called hereditary angioedema. All right, so I'm going to give you this vignette, and I want you to forget about what we're talking about for now. So you can think of this as you would if you were seeing this patient in real life. So a 15-year-old girl presents to your clinic uh, with her mother complaining of recurrent abdominal pain, occasionally accompanied with diarrhea. She describes the episodes as dull in nature, and they last about two or three days before going away. Often they coincide with when she is menstruating, but she's also had them at other times. Her mother says that these episodes have been an ongoing problem since she was about seven years old. She describes the stools as simply loose, but not black or any hue of red. She has never had fever during these episodes. Occasionally, there is vomiting associated with the abdominal pain. She was born term to a G3P2 mother, no complications during birth or infancy. Her newborn screens were normal. Her father also has had problems with abdominal pain and occasional diarrhea and has seen a gastroenterologist. He was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome with predominant diarrhea. On her chart, you note that she has been seen four times uh, in the ED, three times for abdominal pain. Each time, abdominal x-ray and CT were normal, though the radiologist noted some mild edema of the bowel walls. The other visit was when she was eight years old. She was hit by a softball during gym class, which caused her entire right forearm to swell to nearly double its normal size. This went away spontaneously with routine injury instructions. On physical exam, you note a teenage girl, no apparent distress, tracking in the 60th percentile for height and 55th percentile for weight. Abdomen is soft, non-tender, non-distended, no masses. Okay, so like I said, put away what you know we're going to be talking about. Try to make a differential here. What would you be thinking if you saw this patient? So first of all, we know that her chief complaint is abdominal pain, recurrent abdominal pain, which is dull doesn't have any fever with it. There's no blood in the stool. The stools appear normal other than they're just a little loose. Uh, but she has abdominal pain with occasional diarrhea. She's had it for a long time. These have been ongoing episodes, but they're episodic. They only last a few days and then they go away, but then predictably they come back. Uh, we also know that they often coincide with her menstrual cycles. So that's interesting there. We might think of some, some gynecologic problems maybe, so uh, possibly this could be uh, like uh, dysmenorrhea or uh, it could be uh, maybe, uh, I would struggle to put this on the differential based on what we know, but if you didn't know that this has been an ongoing problem since she was seven years old, uh, you might think endometriosis possibly. If if any time you have a woman coming in with symptoms that come and go with her menstrual cycle, you should always be thinking endometriosis. There are at least, it should be on your differential. Uh, what else do we know? Occasionally there's vomiting. Well, yeah, vomiting can happen anytime you have severe abdominal pain. So that doesn't really tell us much. Uh, but we, well, what do we know that this probably isn't? It's probably no, not, not any kind of infection. Because, first of all, she has this, it's recurrent, and she also doesn't have any kind of fever. So, uh, we could probably rule out infection here, uh, almost certainly. Uh, then we also know that her dad has some problems with with abdominal pain, occasional, occasional diarrhea, and so... That is interesting there because we would want to know, ask more questions about that and know how often does he have it. It must be frequent because he saw a gastroenterologist and he was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, which if you know anything about irritable bowel syndrome, you know that this is something these people struggle with on a month-to-month -month basis, week-to-week -week basis, some patients even on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's obviously a problem for her dad too. Uh, now, what else do we know besides this abdom these abdominal issues? So we've come up with some uh, a couple gynecologic differentials. We've come up, okay, possibly irritable bowel syndrome. That's certainly a possibility here. That's what her dad was diagnosed with. Very easily could be diagnosed in her too. Uh, if you're thinking inflammatory bowel disease, probably not because there's no blood in the stool. Her dad was not diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, we could ask more questions, but I would... I would bet that if you ask more questions, 
He doesn't have, have blood in his stool or mucus. Plus, he saw a gastroenterologist. You can bet since gastroenterologists spend like half their time dealing with Crohn's and UC patients, they would probably be on top of that if that were the case. So it's probably not inflammatory bowel disease here. But certainly irritable bowel syndrome is a possibility. Um, and then you can come up with some other things like maybe somatic pain disorder, although that really is probably not it because that typically would not cause diarrhea. Um, but you can put it on your differential for completion sick. Okay, what else do we know about her? We know that she has been seen several times in the ED, and she came in for abdominal pain. So the abdominal pain is clearly severe enough to where she's even gone in to the emergency room. Here she's coming into the clinic. When you come into the clinic for pain, it's usually not the kind of pain that is too disabling. Uh, but if you go into the emergency department, that's where you go when you have such severe pain, you feel like something's really up. And you can, just as a clinical pearl, if a patient is coming into the emergency department, especially if they're insured already, uh, you can bet that it's, it, it's something that's distressing them. It's something, most importantly, it's something very unusual for them, something that they don't deal with frequently enough to where they can put it off and say, oh, well, I'll go into the clinic in a couple weeks. You know, you have to schedule an appointment to go into the clinic. So it's something that you feel can wait a little bit. Okay, so that's just a pro. You don't need to know that for the test. But anyway, uh, so where were we here? I'm kind of going off on my tangents. Uh, so she went into the ED a few times for the abdominal pain, and certainly anytime somebody comes in to the ED with abdominal pain, especially if it's a kid, you know, it's not anything heart-related for the most part, you do an abdominal x-ray, uh, maybe get some, uh, some blood tests, and possibly do a CT. And so in this case, abdominal x-ray and CT have been done, um, some of these visits, and the radiologist noted some mild edema of the bowel walls. Now that's unusual. That's not something that you would see just in an asymptomatic person or in just anybody who doesn't have anything going on. Now, we don't know what she was discharged with when she left, but presumably it wasn't really anything. Otherwise, we would probably know about it from her. Uh, patients usually remember if the doctors tell them they have something. So certainly it wasn't appendicitis, it wasn't a gallbladder issue, but there was this mild edema of the bowel walls. Now, that may or may not be something, but it's something that the radiologist felt we should know, so we include it here. Okay, and then non-abdominal stuff. When she was eight, she got hit by a softball, and it caused her entire right forearm to swell to nearly double its normal size. Now think about that. If you're hit by something, let's say a softball or a baseball, if you don't know what a softball is, it's like a, just a really big baseball. A baseball is roughly the size of a ball that you can fit into the palm of your hand. Uh, so if you're hit with anything, would you expect, if you say you're hitting your forearm, would you expect your arm to double in size? No. You would expect some swelling, but if it doubled in size, that would be unusual. And that certainly is unusual uh, in this case. But it went away spontaneously uh, with routine injury instructions. And usually when things go away on their own, patients tend to forget about it and they don't seek any further investigation. Uh, and that can... That can be problematic sometimes, especially in a case like this where it actually is contributory to this case. Uh, otherwise, though, she's normal. She's not malnourished, so clearly she's not losing fat in, in the diarrhea, uh, and then everything else checks out. So we know that this is hereditary angioedema because it's what we're talking about. However, everything in this case almost everything in this case, lends itself to a diagnosis of hereditary angioedema. First of all, with hereditary angioedema, one of the more salient features, although it's very nonspecific, is abdominal pain. Abdominal pain happens for many reasons. There's inflammation of the viscera, uh, in so stomach, intestines, basically your entire GI tract. All of that viscera can become slightly edematous, and that can cause pain, it can also, when you're talking about the bowel, it can cause diarrhea because the edema from the leaky capillaries uh, will interfere with the bowel's ability to reabsorb water from the lumen, and that's going to lead to diarrhea. What else uh, is contributory here? Her father. 
has this same problem, very similar problem. And as we're going to see, hereditary angioedema, it's hereditary. It's passed down autosomal dominant. And certainly you can get de novo cases. That's totally, totally happens. Uh, but you should always look for a, a if, if you've got a case you should that you're thinking of, you should always look to see if there are siblings or certainly a parent who is affected because that will give you a hint too. Uh, and then, of course, the bowel wall being uh, slightly edematous, and then obviously this this issue with the forearm. And this should have been investigated immediately. Uh, maybe they weren't in when the forearm was doubled in size, but if you ever see a forearm that's doubled in size and they, it's just because they got hit by a softball, you're looking for something else. This is not just this is not just garden variety injury and swelling. Okay, so just telling you that right there. Now you can see how this is very difficult because you have all these sort of non-specific things kind of coming together over a long period of time. And this is what makes hereditary angioedema so difficult to, I'm not going to say difficult to diagnose, but difficult to hone in on. Once you think it's hereditary angioedema, it's very easy to diagnose. You get a simple blood test. Uh, doesn't get much easier. But it can be very difficult to put two and two together with this one. Okay, so before we talk about hereditary angioedema and its causes and what it does and how we diagnose it and how we manage it, I want to talk about the complement pathway. And I want to talk about the complement pathway because it is here where the, the pathophysiology of hereditary angioedema is. Now, a lot of physicians will not memorize the complement pathway, and that's okay because... For the most part, all of these complements with the numbers and everything, it's not as important to remember as the gist of what this is. Now, the complement pathway, uh, when you see it written down, it's going to be in these Arabic numerals. And that's because we refer to these oftentimes as just in short shorthand as factor 4, factor 2, factor 3, factor 5, factor 6, 7, 8, 9. And that can be confusing when you hear us talk also about... The, uh, the the coagulation factors. So when you see them written out, if somebody writes factor four and it's in the Arabic numeral four, then they're talking about the complement factor. If it's in Roman numeral four, IV, they're talking about the coagulation factor four. Okay, but it, it should also be written with this big C too. That will help you as well. Now, there are some interactions between the complement pathway and the coagulation pathway, believe it or not, but we're not going to talk about that here. That's not as important. So there are another thing that this has in common with the coagulation pathway is that you have these two sort of, actually we have three in the complement pathway, there's these two sorts of pathways that occur independently, but they kind of coalesce into a common pathway. And that happens in the complement pathway as well. Now, like I said, we have three. I only put two here because two of these are very similar. You have your classical pathway, which you respond to antibodies on a pathogen. You have an alternative pathway, which is just sort of this independent uh, pathway that kind of does its own thing and gets activated, particularly when the uh, when when the factor is in uh, when it's in contact with bacterial wall. Uh, and then you also have a lectin pathway, which is similar to the classical pathway, except it's not activated by uh, interaction with antibodies, rather it's activated by interactions with these certain carbohydrates that are on bacterial walls. Okay, so let's talk about this classical pathway. We have this C1 complex, and this is the very beginning of our classical pathway, and it interacts with a pathogen that has an antibody on it. And so all it needs to do is see the antibody on a pathogen. It doesn't need to know what the pathogen is. All it needs to do is see antibody on pathogen. Okay, so in that regard, this is part of your innate immune system. What do we mean by innate? We mean that you don't need to know what the pathogen is. You just respond to something that is not supposed to be there. Uh, so uh, this is part of our innate immune system. You don't have, I mean, you do have to make antibodies for, for the classical pathway, uh, but it's 
your innate immune system because you don't need to know what the pathogen is. Now, when you start making antibodies and your B cells are making antibodies and your T cells are telling your B cells what to do, in that case, you do need to know what the pathogen is. But in this case, we don't, and so it's part of the innate immune system. Uh, so the ultimate goal of the innate immune or of, of the complement pathway is to do two things. It's to coat the pathogen with complement, and this is called opsonization. Opsonization comes from the Greek word opson, which is sort of like a side dish that you eat with your uh, with your main meal, um, and it's also comes from the Greek word for delicious or tasty. Uh, so you can think of it as your body putting salt and pepper on the pathogen, so you can your macrophages can consume it, and that's ultimately the goal. Uh, when we get this IC3B, this actually uh, will glom on to the pathogen, and then the macrophages can eat it. Um, another thing that the complement pathway does is it makes this thing known as the membrane attack complex. And what this does, this is very important uh, when you're dealing with Neisseria, both Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Um, when we see defects here, we see uh, a proclivity to developing Neisseria infections. Uh, but this membrane attack complex is sort of your end goal of the complement pathway. And you really only need one or two of, uh, one of the three of these uh, to, to be working to ultimately develop a membrane attack complex, but typically they're working uh, at the same time. So this classical pathway, you get the pathogen uh, with the antibodies interacting with the C1 complex. The C1 complex will split the C4 into C4A and C4B. C4B will split C2 into C2A and C2B, and on and on it goes. Then you have the C2A and C2B. Uh, or C4B rather, which it acts as a C3 convertase, and that is sort of the end of the strictly classical pathway. Uh, so as it lyses C3 into C3A and C3B, C3B will then come on to the C2A, C4B complex, and it'll form this C2A, C4B, C3B uh, complex. This is known as a C5 convertase because this converts C5 into C5A, C5B. And C5B is what you need to pull in your C6 through C9 to form the membrane attack complex. Now there's another way you can go. Uh, the, the lectin pathway that I told you about is very similar to the classical pathway as far as uh, as far as the this, this sequence, C4 to C2 to C3 to C5. Uh, the alternative pathway is a little bit different. So with the alternative pathway, what you have is this sort of random, what they call a tick over of C3. So C3 will just spontaneously uh, combust into C3A and C3B. But that's very short-lived, and that's a good thing because we don't want this pathway to just activate itself constitutively. Uh, so occasionally what's going to happen is C3 is going to split into C3A and C3B, and it's going to be more likely to happen the closer it is to bacterial wall. Um, now, when this pathway is actually activated, uh, you have C3B, uh, then this is going to uh, glom on to factor B, which then gets divided up into BB and BA by something called factor D, uh, then you have this complex known as C3BBB, and this also acts as a C3 convertase. And when this happens, then this process really starts for realsies. So you have C3 uh, going to C3A and C3B, and now another C3B will come onto that, and then you have your C3BBB, C3B, and that works the same as your end product from your classical pathway, ultimately giving rise to the C5B that will form part of your membrane attack complex. Now that having been said, what about these other things that kind of come off C4A and C3A and C5A? Are they doing anything important? Yes, they are. C3A and C5A act as inflammatory mediators. So they will cause inflammation as they're being produced. Okay. Now, here is where this becomes important for hereditary angioedema. Way back up here you have this thing called C1 inhibitor. And what C1 inhibitor is, is it's sort of a check 
on this whole process where you have pathogens that have antibodies onto it. Okay, great. But do you always want to be activating this pathway at, at full speed ahead every time you have a pathogen uh, in the area? And the answer to that is no, you don't. And so you have a C1 inhibitor that sort of serves as a counterbalance uh, to, this, to this pathway. Uh, and so in patients who have hereditary angioedema, either they have no C1 inhibitor or very low levels of it, or they have a non-functional C1 inhibitor. And so what this is going to mean is that for one reason or another, and there is another reason that I haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to it, this complement pathway is going to be overactive. And that is one reason why these patients will get inflammation. All right, now there are other reasons that relate to this C1 inhibitor that don't have anything to do with the complement pathway, but I figured I'd get you started here. Uh, now, you're going to see in other immunological disorders like factor I deficiency uh, that the complement pathway is even more important for those diseases, uh, but uh, I'm just getting you a good start here with hereditary hentiotema. So uh, hopefully you got the gist of this. Okay. So hereditary angioedema is a deficiency or a deficient function of C1 inhibitor, which remember is our counterbalance, for lack of a better word, to our complement pathway. C1 inhibitor serves three important purposes. First, like we said, it inhibits the C1 complex from cleaving C4 to C4A and C4B, which is the beginning of our classical pathway uh, for complement activation. It is also a chief inhibitor of calicreen. What the heck is calicreen? This is probably something you've heard before, a name you've heard before, but you totally forgot what it is and what it does, and that's okay because we don't know a whole lot about it, but we know one very important thing that it does, and that is that calicreen catalyzes the conversion of kininogen to bradykinin. Remember what bradykinin is. That's probably a little bit more familiar to you, especially when you think of maybe ACE inhibitors and coughing, and that is exactly what bradykinin does. Bradykinin is uh, what we know as a vasoactive peptide, and bradykinin, if you have too much of it, yes, it will cause you to cough, and that's kind of part of the process we see in angioedema where they can get this laryngeal uh, edema. Uh, but it also is, uh, where was I going to go with that? Uh, so it's, it's also in very high amounts it causes that edema because it expands, uh, well actually it contracts the endothelial cells and creates gaps in the walls. So that's bradykinin. Uh, now if you if you lose your chief inhibitor of calicreen, then calicreen is going to be overactive. And if calicreen helps make bradykinin, then if you lose your inhibitor of calicreen, you have way too much bradykinin. All right? And this is a, a very similar process to what happens when you take an ACE inhibitor and you get the coughing. And remember what you also can get with ACE inhibitors? angioedema, one of the rare but feared and characteristic complications of ACE inhibitors, and that's actually an acquired angioedema. All right, uh, and then also it inhibits factor 11 and factor 12. You can see here there's a little bit of, uh, of play between uh, the complement and factor, uh, coagulation factor systems, but we're not going to talk about that one. This one's not quite as important, but I'll show you a flow chart where you can kind of appreciate it. Okay, so we talked about hereditary angioedema in our vignette having an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. Now, with any autosomal dominant disorder, don't go right to thinking that you have to have a parent who has the disorder because you don't. You can have autosomal dominant disorders where uh, there's variable penetrance, so mom or dad is a carrier, and they should have the disorder, and maybe they do, but it's to such a minute degree that it's not diagnosed. And that happens a lot in hereditary angioedema, where child has the disease and it's very obvious. Mom is a carrier or dad is a carrier, and they don't even know it. Or you can have a de novo mutation. 
So you have an autosomal dominant disorder, but this mutation just came out of nowhere. It's sporadic. And mom and dad aren't carriers. Baby has the disease. Uh, but ba and baby truly is the right baby for this mom and dad, but it's just de novo. It came out of nowhere. The epidemiology. So I told you this is a rare disorder, and it is. 1 in 50 to 1 in 150,000 people are affected. And there are no racial uh, disparities that we know of, no ethnic disparities. It, this occurs uh, relatively equally throughout all populations. This accounts for 2% of all angioedema cases. So we see a lot of angioedema, and a lot of them, I suspect, are caused from ACE inhibitors. This does not make up nearly the number of angioedema cases that you might think, considering this is called hereditary angioedema. Most of the angioedema cases that you see are going to be acquired. Uh, so only 2%. So if you see angioedema, it's only a 1 in 50 shot that it's actually going to be hereditary angioedema. Males and females are affected equally. This is true. However, the attacks are worse in females. Not sure why that is. However, we do know that females have a tendency for this to happen with their menstrual cycles. So maybe that plays a role. I don't know. Okay, so this is sort of that uh, interplay between the factor system, the coagulation factor system, and the complement system. So when you have trauma, and we're going to see that trauma is very important uh, in causing these episodes of angioedema, trauma is actually responsible for ultimately initiating uh, or activating factor 12. And factor 12 is uh, ultimately going to cleave plasminogen into plasmin, and plasmin is going to convert pre calicreon into calicreon. And calicreon is sort of the evil, evil, uh, when you say the, this is the wicked witch of hereditary angioedema because it's this that's going to, it's calicreon that's going to set off the fireworks here. So factor 12 is, needs to be activated and it is activated by trauma and it, will start making calicreon from pre-calicreon. It catalyzes it. Um, and then it also uh, catalyzes plasminogen to plasmin. So it does those things. Uh, once you have calicreon, as you know, with hereditary angioedema, you also are lacking uh, your, um, your other mechanisms with the complement system that are going to keep you from uh, spitting out fluid from your endothelial walls. Uh, so these two things kind of come together. I think I have a, let me see if I have, okay, oh good. All right, I'm glad I put this in here. I made this. Um, and this is, I wanted to kind of show you how these two things kind of converge. Because you might, if you've gotten the wrong idea from what I've said, uh, you might be thinking that there are two separate in distinct ways that this happens, but they really kind of come together. So fact, activation of factor 12A causes both an activation of calicreon and an activation of proactivator, which I'm not exactly sure what that is, but ultimately it is, in, it is responsible for the indirect activity of factor 12 uh, to convert plasminogen to plasmin. So once you have plasmin, what you can do with that is you can cleave C2B into C2 kinin, which is also a vasoactive peptide, just like bradykinin. And you can also, plasmin is also responsible for activating the C1 complex. So let's go back here. So you, have, you don't have C1 inhibitor, right? That's gone in hereditary angioedema. What you also have too much of with hereditary angioedema, for the exact reasons listed here, because you have activation of 12A, uh, is that you also will have overactivation of the C1 complex because you have too much plasmin. And so that C1 complex then can set off your complement pathway, and that's going to ultimately cause the C2 kinin to come up, which is a vasoactive peptide, which is going to result in increased vascular permeability. Now, here's where it all starts to come together and make sense. Where does our C1 inhibitor come into play in all of this? C1 inhibitor can stop this cycle at many different points. 
So C1 inhibitor can inhibit the activation of factor 12A, and so it can stop it way up here. C1 inhibitor can also inhibit calicreen from working on caninogen to form bradykinin. C1 inhibitor can also inhibit plasmin from cleaving C2B into C2 kinin. And C1 inhibitor directly, as its name suggests, prevents activation of the C1 complex. So C1 inhibitor works on all sorts of different things, not just keeping the activation of the C1 complex from happening. Um, so you can see when you lose C1 inhibitor, all of these different points now are, you let the break off. And so this all is going to lead to vascular permeability. And it starts with injury, because injury activates factor 12. And so if you have injury, you've started out up here, you've got all this activated factor 12, and you can just flood the cycle without your C1 inhibitor. Now for those of us who don't have hereditary angioedema, if we get injured, yes, we activate a lot of factor 12. However, we have C1 inhibitor here to stop this process from going crazy. And so we don't get that elevated vascular permeability where you get swelling in your abdomen and swelling in your face and swelling of your tongue and swelling of your larynx. Uh, you'll stop it with C1 inhibitor. People with hereditary angioedema don't have that break. So what happens from this then is local trauma results in increased vascular permeability and swelling. And this can manifest in different organs. And a lot of times what you'll see is, for instance, you get hit in the arm. Or you get, uh, so this can happen too. So, you, you know, if you're, if you're mowing the lawn and you know how the lawnmower vibrates, uh, that it, that itself is enough trauma because it's happening so much that people with hereditary angioedema, if they mow the lawn with that vib vibrating lawnmower, uh, they can actually get swelling in their hands. Or let's say they're riding a horse and that causes a little bit of trauma against the buttocks. That can cause, that, that's trauma there and that can cause localized trauma. Or as we saw in our patient in our vignette, she got hit in the arm by a softball. Suddenly, her arm is twice the size as it was before. So you can have local trauma, and that can result in swelling there. But you can also have migrating uh, swelling, too. So it doesn't always have to be constricted to one area. So where does the swelling occur most? It occurs in the abdominal organs, so stomach, intestines. Also can happen in the bladder. You can have... Uh, you can you can have where you can't urinate because the bladder is swollen or you don't have enough room in the bladder so you get incontinence. Uh, it can happen in the kidney. I'm not sure exactly uh, to what degree that might affect you. And then of course the subcutaneous tissues, face, hands, arms, legs, genitals, buttocks. And then obviously of the utmost importance the larynx and the tongue. And this is important because this is how these patients can die. The spells will worsen over 12 to 24 hours, and then they'll spontaneously remit after 72 hours. And the localization during this time might migrate. So they may have gotten hit in the arm, and that might then later become abdominal pain. Because all of this stuff is truly systemic. Because you have factor 12 activated in one place, it gets into the blood, and it can go to other places too and cause... Uh, edema there. Now this will spontaneously remit after 72 hours after you clear all that activated factor 12 and all of the, your bradykinin and stuff. Uh, however these spells do start and then they worsen and then they go away. Now not all patients have the time for them to spontaneously remit, remit especially if they have upper airway issues. So that's important to know too. Precipitating factors, we already talked about that. Trauma, also, that's going to be the precipitating factor in most cases uh, that we know the precipitating factor. Uh, also, infection, uh, surgery, that would fall under trauma, so like dental work. And then menstruation, that's classic. There can be prodromal symptoms that are present. So usually one to two hours before the episode, these patients will often get a tingling sensation in the affected area. I'm not sure what causes the tingling. Possibly some uh, very, very, very mild edema around the peripheral nerves. Uh, 
but I'm not sure. Uh, on physical exam, you might note some swelling, uh, and that we would expect, uh, and that will generally get worse just depending on where they are in the time frame of it. Oftentimes it becomes quite dramatic. They can get a rash, and this rash is, uh, it's pretty, well, I wouldn't say characteristic because it can be confused with a lot of things, but it's, it's, I can tell you what it never is. It's, it's not an, an itchy rash, rash, so it's not like hives. Uh, it's typically erythematous, it's very flat, and it's never itchy. And this is called erythema marginatum. So that could be present. The abdominal exam, because they have swelling in their viscera, uh, they can have uh, signs consistent with a bowel obstruction or certainly acute abdomen because their abdomen is in so much pain. Now, in very severe cases of hereditary angioedema, uh, hypotension can be present, and that's just due to the fact that there's so much vascular permeability, you're spilling so much fluid out, basically third spacing it, that you now have insufficient uh, fluid in your uh, in your intravascular space. So this is a an example of a patient with uh, hereditary angioedema. You can see that she clearly looks much different. Uh, cheeks are affected. The lips, the lips are very prominently affected. Uh, the lips and the tongue are your characteristic areas that are affected. Uh, when your face is affected. They're going to stand out the most. Uh, you note here what might be uh, your skin rash, the erythema marginatum. Here, but it's hard to tell. It's kind of grainy. So again, these are very obvious. When it, when it happens in the face, you'll know it. So as you can see here, the lips are the most affected. The nose is probably affected to a certain degree. Notice that her uh, her nares are sort of antiverted here, uh, whereas in this picture they're not. That's probably due to a little bit of uh, swelling in the nose too. So the hands are also affected very frequently. It's hard to really appreciate it in this child. I think this left hand is a little bit more normal than the right hand. Um, but if you were to feel, you would definitely feel edema. It's a non-pitting edema, but it's there. So again here, notice the lips. And the patient will tell you, this is not what I look like. Okay, lips, nose, I didn't notice that before. Maybe the nose does become a little bit more antiverted uh, as part of the angioedema. It's kind of hard sometimes because the lips are so obvious that it's, you really don't even think to look for other things. But certainly there's going to be like this periorbital puffiness too. Okay, and then here's the hands. So just by looking at the, the hand in relation to the fingers, you can see that there's obviously some swelling. You know, it's as if you, know, you were to like blow air into this patient's hands and it just kind of swells up. So here we have a, a hand that's affected versus a hand that's not affected. They don't always have to both be affected. And so here you can see very obvious difference here. So if only one hand's affected, that can be useful because you can compare it to the other hand. It's why you know God gave us two of a lot of things to make life easier for doctors. Okay, now here's where it starts to get really not not funny and kind of serious. So here's a tongue. Um, you can see is very enlarged. And this can be problematic because you can start to obstruct the airway. And not only that, but if the tongue is so large, then you may even have problems doing orotracheal int intubation. So you may actually need to do a tracheostomy uh, for these patients because it's going to get, it's going to be very difficult to get tools in there. Okay, so men who get angioedema can also get scrotal swelling. I am not sure if this was an angioedema case. I just wanted to find a case of scrotal swelling so I could show you uh, because scrotal swelling is very common in, in uh, men who have angioedema. Not in all cases, but it can happen. So this is what scrotal edema would look like. Okay, so what do you do for workup? This is the problem. If you think it's hereditary angioedema, 
all you need to do is get one test. Okay, but the thing is, is that you probably thought it was other things before you thought it was angioedema. So let's look at the labs you might have already gotten. Most of the time, if you have a patient with abdominal pain, you're going to get basic lab work. So BMP, CBC. Your BMP may reveal prerenal azotemia if the intravascular volume loss is sufficient. So not always, but it might uh, point you in that direction. Otherwise, your electrolytes are going to be fine. CBC will be unremarkable unless there is an infectious trigger. So if the patient has flu or strep throat, or something like that, then your CBC might be off. And infectious causes can truly trigger hereditary angioedema spells. Uh, but again, it doesn't always have to be the case. It can be from trauma. On imaging, if you get an abdominal x-ray, uh, you may see features of ileus. Uh, if you get, and usually you need to see this on sonography or on CT, but you can note edematous thickening of the bowel walls. Uh, you may also note peritoneal fluid. That's something you might be able to check for on sono. For chest x-ray, a lot of these cases will have a mild pleural effusion just because of the vascular permeability. So when you suspect hereditary angioedema, what are you going to do? I want you to reflexively know this. I think hereditary angioedema, I get a C4 level. That's exactly what you're doing. Okay, let's go back, all the way back. Uh, C4. Okay, so what is the very, very, very first thing that is affected when C1 is abundantly active? C4 is the first thing that gets cleaved. C4 will get cleaved into C4A and C4B. And so your C4 levels are going to be very low because as quickly as you make C4, you with, with this perpetually active C1 complex, you're splitting it up into C4A and C4B. So your C4 levels, of all of these complement levels, your C4 level is going to be the one that's most affected because it is the most proximal to our site of error, which is the C1 inhibitor, C1 complex. So C4 is going to go way down because it's being converted as quickly as you can make it. So your C4 level is going to be very, very low. Okay. Okay, what do we do for management? So a patient comes in, hereditary angioedema. We, we know that's what it is. Let's say they have an alert bracelet. What are you not going to do, let's say, if they're having difficulty breathing? You're not going to give epinephrine. Okay, that is always the wrong answer. What is the problem in patients who can't breathe who have laryngeal edema because of angioedema? It's laryngeal edema. Okay, it's not, it, even though they may be wheezing, and it might, and it came on suddenly, and it looks like anaphylactic shock. It is not. Okay, this is not bronchial constriction, a smooth muscle issue. This is edema, and epinephrine does absolutely nothing for edema. Corticosteroids does absolutely nothing for edema. Might even make it worse. Okay, so you're not. This is not an allergic response as far as histamine. This is a vascular permeability crisis. So you are not ever going to give epinephrine. Epinephrine would do absolutely nothing. Steroids would probably make it worse. And so as far as if we need to establish an airway in a patient who is having respiratory crisis with angioedema, you're going straight in to intubate one way or another, either orotracheal or tracheostomy. Okay, But you are not going to be giving epinephrine. This is not an anaphylactic reaction. Okay, that blinking probably was driving you nuts. Okay, now there are medications that we do give in acute attacks. And actually, all of these things that we have now didn't even exist as little as seven years ago. 2008, I believe, was the first, uh, I think Synrise was the very first, uh, the very first treatment we had for acute attacks of angioedema. So, uh, we have now five drugs in the arsenal for hereditary angioedema, and you can choose. I boldface these top two here, uh, but for giving for an, an acute attack of hereditary angioedema, of course, you always want to stabilize the airway. That's always first thing to do. And then your very next thing you're going to do is administer pharmacologic treatment. 
Typically, this comes in the form of C1 inhibitor concentrates. Uh, so there are three formulations of these, two human, one recombinant. Don't worry about picking one, and I wouldn't even worry about these names. They don't have, uh, because these are just reformulations of things that already exist in the body, like kind of like interferon, uh, they don't have uh, tr generic names. Uh, so that's why I included the, the trade names here. Um, but what you need to know for the test, if you do get asked a question about angioedema, what do you do after you stabilize the patient, give C1 inhibitor concentrates. You can also give a calicreon inhibitor, and this is also fine too. This is, this is equally as good an option as the C1 inhibitor concentrate. This is called a calantide, and it sounds like calicreon kind of, uh, but uh, a calantide or a calbitor is uh, a calicreon inhibitor, and that will stop this, like I said, calicreon is kind of the wicked witch of this disorder. Uh, so that will stop it in its tracks. There's also a new one that came out, I believe, last year called a catabant, and that is a bradykinin receptor antagonist. So it's kind of doing the same thing as a calicreon inhibitor, just one step further down the road. Um, and so this is uh, marketed as Firazir, and this just came out last year. Um, and then if you don't have any of these available, but you have fresh frozen plasma laying around, then go ahead and use that. But we prefer to use the C1 inhibitor concentrates or calicreon inhibitor. Okay, now this becomes important for these patients. You have a patient who's got hereditary angioedema, they get these spells, they're freaked out because this is just like, you know, a person who's allergic to bees, except these patients can't just avoid their trigger. These triggers can happen just suddenly out of nowhere. And if it means that their, their throat closes up, that can be really horrifying. And so we want to do prophylaxis for these patients by all means. And the best prophylaxis for patients with angioedema is danazole. And danazole is an androgen. And there are a few patients we cannot give danazole to, and that's going to be prostate cancer patients. Prostate cancer is common, a little bit more common in older men. Uh, so if a patient on an older man, then they probably don't have prostate cancer. Uh, but then the more common patients that we don't give danazole to are uh, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding and then children. I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff there is, but I'm guessing it's probably circa puberty uh, because is, danazole being an androgen uh, is, uh, can cause precocious puberty in males and interfere with puberty in girls. Uh, but just because something says pediatrics, not for children, doesn't mean it's under 18, because certainly you can give Tylenol to a 16-year-old. You know, it's not like you magically turn 18, you know, not like going and seeing an R-rated movie or something. Uh, but I put pediatrics here, meaning generally with ch young children, we do not give Danazol. Uh, older children, like 16, 17, 18 years old, you probably could get away with it. But I'm not exactly sure what the exact cutoff is. It probably varies. Um, other agents. So this is what we give for children and pregnant women or prostate cancer patients. We can give them epsilon aminocaproic acid or tranexamic acid. Uh, these are not as effective as danazole, but they're better than nothing. Now, if the patient is going to be getting a surgical procedure, and this includes even such things like dental work, so you're going in and getting drilled with everything and scraped with uh, your just your regular cleanings, or if you're getting wisdom teeth taken out, or root canal, uh, even that is a surgical procedure to say nothing of, you know, getting a your gallbladder removed, or uh, getting part of your thyroid removed, or something like that. Uh, any kind of surgical procedure is going to require a short-term prophylaxis above and beyond just your oral danazole. Um, typically, we'll give these patients C1 inhibitor infusions 24 hours before a procedure. Although, I think I've read that you can actually go up on the danazole for five days before the procedure. But sometimes, you have uh, you, know, you don't have that, that luxury of time. So, uh, typically what happens is if a patient's going to get surgery 24 hours before their surgery, they'll get a C1 inhibitor infusion.
So other guidelines for angioedema. So treat attacks as soon as possible. That kind of goes without saying. These patients should carry on-demand treatment for two attacks. So they should have two supplies, two doses at all times. That sounds just like what we do for people who are allergic to bees or people who are allergic to peanuts in case you know, they go into anaphylaxis. And it's really the same concept. You, know, you never know when it's going to happen, so you carry something with you just in case. You should teach self-administration. So these things are taken subcutaneously, so they're going to need to be taught how to administer it. And it's pretty simple, but uh, that's your job to teach them. Uh, they should carry an ID card or a medical alert bracelet. If you've watched my lectures, you probably know by now I'm a big proponent of medical alert bracelets because... While you, as a physician, may have access to patients' files, paramedics do not. And they see a patient, they have no idea who it is, and they don't typically know who the patient is until they get to the hospital, unless they have a medical alert bracelet. And there are so many things that they can do to save your life uh, if they know that you have a certain uh, problem. So like Addison's disease. Well, they might need cortisol. Hereditary angioedema. Well, let's let the ED doctor know to have C1 inhibitor all ready for them uh, so that uh, they can survive. So important to have something identifying them as hereditary angioedema, especially considering it's so rare, too. Referral to an allergist. Yeah, well, this is a rare disorder, so it's probably going to be handled by one of those people that went to school for this. Uh, and then test all offspring and siblings, so it's autosomal dominant, so 50-50 chance sibling has it. And then ACE inhibitors are absolutely contraindicated. Duh. Like we want to put another, like we want to throw another, uh, another wrench into the mechanisms here. So we already know that ACE inhibitors are going to increase the amount of bradykinin, and so if you're already struggling with that, you don't want to you know, add fuel onto the fire. So ACE inhibitors are absolutely contraindicated. We have other things we can use instead of ACE inhibitors. We can use angiotensin receptor blockers. We can use beta blockers. We can use calcium channel blockers. All sorts of things you can use for blood pressure control. ACE inhibitors cross off the list for people with angioedema. If you're treating with danazole, and this is just sort of precautionary measures, because there's some hepatotoxicity to danazole, uh, even though we use it in small enough doses to where we're typically fine, but uh, you're going to biannually get a CBC, urinalysis, liver function tests, and lipids, and then every year they should have sonography because there is a slightly increased risk of developing tumors of the liver. All right, and that brings us to the end of hereditary angioedema. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know, and I will see you next time.